For those of you who have been on the workshops, you know that I'm super practical and I give you exact tips and ideas of how to use uh, the different techniques that we're walking through. Um, and today we're going into cognitive biases. So if you received my email this week, um, you know that it was kind of sparked from the whole um, pizza <laughs> situation that I was in last week, um, which was awesome. It was actually almost two weeks ago. Wow. Um, so um, we're going to be talking about cognitive biases and we're going to really dive into the three, um, not the three, but top three cognitive biases that you can use in optimization. And in optimization, I mean, you can use them on landing pages, you can use them on emails, you can use them on your website. Um, and in fact, we're gonna be talking about two cognitive biases that you should be using and one cognitive bias that you should be aware of, that you should, when you're looking at your stuff, make sure that you're not kind of triggering it. Um, and I'll explain everything about what, um, what this actually means, what are cognitive biases in just a moment. Because um, we'll be starting in one minute. I'll be, I'll be sharing my screen and I'll sh just walk you through everything. Um, and as I said, if you have any questions, jump into chat and we will answer everything that we can. And at the end of the um, slide deck, I will answer your questions. And when we're done, we're done. We go back to work or our evenings or whatever we're doing so that you guys can go straight in and start implementing everything that we just spoke about. So I think I've given enough <laughs> intro. Let's, um, let's get this party started. So let me share my screen and as usual hope that, oh, it worked. Wow, that's a first for Zoom. Um, that you guys can see my screen. Sophia will let me know in chat if there's any pro problem. I'm also gonna turn off my camera because normally that causes all sorts of issues. So let's see. All right, cool. So today we're talking about three psychological triggers that turn more visitors into customers. Now, one final thing, because I get asked this quite a bit, um, all of our um, workshops are uploaded to our blog within 48 hours. That means that on our blog, when you just go to getuplift.co slash blog, you will find all the workshops that we've done so far. We upload the decks, we upload the transcript, the video itself, and if we have any templates, then we also have those um, added to the blog too. Okay. So let's start talking about cognitive biases. So I guess in simple words, cognitive biases or psychological triggers, depending on how you, know, you wanna call them, are a brain's tendency to think in certain ways. So our brain uses these biases to make, to make decisions more easily. Essentially our brain's really lazy. Um, if you haven't watched the webinar, the first workshop from uh, February, um, I advise you to watch that one. I talk about how our brain makes decisions, the slow brain, the fast thinking brain, and I kind of break it down into um, how the brain makes decisions, so it's very helpful. Um, but essentially, these biases determine how we make decision uh, decisions, what actions we take, who we become friends with, what we eat, how we feel in every given moment. Um, who we believe, who we don't. Essentially, as Wikipedia explains, cognitive biases are systematic patterns of deviation from norm or rationality in judgment. So this means that these biases, they tend to deviate us from rational and logical decision-making. What this means is that they affect us in a way that we're normally unaware of, and they affect our decision-making process. So normally we'll just make these decisions, we'll think that they were completely rational, completely logical, but they're affected by, the, by our decisions are affected by these um, biases, and we're normally unaware of them. Now, why does this matter to you? other than you know, knowing how your brain makes decisions, because every single element on your page, from your headline to your chosen colors, to the images that you choose, your fonts, and the story that you tell, every element on your page has an impact um, and can trigger some sort of bias in your target audience. 
thousands of biases affect our decisions every single day. Some are more common than others, and it's important to know what they are, how they work, and what the most common ones are so that you can either avoid them, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, or make use of them to increase conversions. So one thing is very clear though, is that most of the time we're completely unaware of these biases and have no idea which one is at play. So as you know, and if you don't know, so um, here's um, an update. We have a very, very long list and guide for cognitive biases on our site. Um, it's one of our blog posts. You can either read it on um, our blog or you can download the PDF and it has um, a list of, I think, I think about 50 different cognitive biases. Um, here, Sophia actually threw that into chat where you can download um, that, uh, <laughs> that PDF. Um, and it gives you exact explanations on different cognitive biases, how you can use them, what they mean, and how to avoid them, or stuff like that, and examples, of course. So um, today I'm going to dive further into three of these biases and give you some tips, tactics, and ideas on how you can leverage them, um, starting right now. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started with the first cognitive bias. That is the bandwagon effect. Let me know in chat, guys, if you have heard of this effect. Um, I'd just love to hear it, because as we go through these biases, they're very common, and I'd love to know if you've heard of it, if you've used it before, um, and stuff like that. So, um, here we have the bandwagon effect. It, um, essentially, it's a bias that focuses on our tendency to change our opinions, our decisions, our beliefs, and even our ideas according to the amount of people who think in a certain way. So think about it. It's really interesting. In our most inner deep selves, I guess, most of us just want to be like everybody else. We want to conform and we want to feel like we're a part of a larger group. Um, so the bandwagon effect states that there's essentially powers in numbers, power in numbers. The more amount of people think in a certain way, the more likely it is to grow in popularity and be trusted by others. Oh, my dog just walked in here. Sorry. <laughs> um, so for example, um, let's say that, you know, our political views may change according to the amount of people who we see on our Facebook feed support a certain candidate. Or if we're comparing between two products, we'll tend to choose the more popular one, um, the one we've heard more about and seen more people use. So this is a really interesting thing because um, as Craig says, it's conformity. It's, it's a lot of different things in us, but at the end of the day, what we want is to be like other people, it's to adapt and think in the same way. And as I mentioned, most of us aren't aware that we don't think that our opinions changed according to the numbers, but they do. And um, even more interestingly is that when it's people who are close to you, so family and friends, the more family and friends think the same way, the more obviously you're prone to um, thinking the same way too, but it's not just people you know. So let's talk about how you can leverage the bandwagon effect. So um, highlight numbers, amounts, and groups of people who choose your solution. Um, we've all seen these around, I guess, statements like thousands of customers are already enjoying their music like never before, or you know, these are great ways to highlight the popularity of your solution. At the end of the day, your goal is to emphasize your popularity and show potential customers that you are a safe choice, the one everyone chooses. So here's a few examples. There's uh, Grow Boldly joined 45,000 businesses that trust lead pages every day to grow their business online. It's a great way to um, leverage the bandwagon effect. And another way, get response users, over 350,000 happy, happy customers and counting. So, and it says, don't take our word for it, see what all the buzz is about. And they have all the testimonials and stuff, but it comes together. Now there's other ways you can do it. For example, um, 
This is from Basecamp. Basecamp is a competitor to Trello and Asana. Um, and they, they do something really cool. They say 3,716 businesses signed up last week to get results like these. And they kind of highlight the 89% um, have had um, have a better handle on their business. 84% report more self-sufficient teams. 59% uh, have fewer weekly meetings. So all of this is about numbers and it shows you kind of the uh, really uh, emphasis on the amount of people, even in percentage, that agree to a certain thing, that think in a certain way, that believe um, something. Um, another thing you can do is feature reviews of your product and your solutions. So showing not, uh, not the actual reviews, but how many you've been given is a great way to show popularity. The more reviews you have, um, the more you succeed in showing yourself as a common chosen solution by customers. So over here on the right, um, this is from Yopo. Um, you'll see an e-commerce site featuring their reviews. So that's just kind of like, hey, you know, um, these are the people who have been reviewing this and you can go in and see. And on the left, whoops, where's it gone? Whoops, oh, I clicked left because I said on the left. <laughs> on the left, um, we have G2 Crowd, which is a popular platform for rating SaaS products. Um, I've chosen Zendesk as an example because they have 1,400 reviews with a great score, 4.2. So um, something as simple as this could be added to their site and they could mention, hey, we're rated 4.2 on G-Crown by thousands of customers. So it's just a cool way of using the bandwagon effect, not just by saying how many people use you, but even just saying, you know, these amount of people have reviewed us. These are the amount of people who have bought our product. These are the amount of people who trust us and so on and so on. So all that is just a quick way of leveraging the bandwagon effect. By the way, another very popular uh, way of using bandwagon, a bandwagon effect, uh, you've probably seen uh, used countless times, is on pricing pages, where you highlight one specific plan and it just says most popular for uh, plan of the month for stuff like that. You probably have seen like examples like that, but it's it's a really cool way. And I'll show you an example of that when we move on. Um, let's talk about the next cognitive bias, and that is loss aversion. So loss aversion um, is we actually spoke about this bias a little last week when we talked about Cialdini. Um, we talked about Cialdini's seven principles of persuasion to increase conversion. So if you haven't seen that one, strongly recommend watching it. Uh, loss aversion is our tendency to avoid loss or losing out at all costs. So according to psychologists, the sense of losing out or missing something is so hard for us that we feel more towards it than when we gain something. So what that means is that most people will consider the loss of the loss of $50 far more significant than the excitement of gaining $200. And it's really interesting because we just try to avoid feeling that loss at all costs. So we would rather um, avoid a loss than gain something. Now, this is actually where scarcity comes in um, to play, right? So let's talk about it. We have uh, the most common way of using loss aversion is by letting people know that something is running out, right? Um, a sale is about to end or there are a limited amount of products to be purchased or services to be delivered. Um, you'll see these tactics in emails or in sales pages, in pop-ups, um, on pricing pages and many other uh, places on websites. Um, now on the right, you can see Melissa Griffin. She is, if you don't know her, you should definitely follow her. She's awesome. She's a Pinterest um, influencer and she teaches people how to use Pinterest to grow their business. Um, but Melissa Griffin is using loss aversion in her email to sell her course. So you'll notice it says early bird bonuses expiring in four hours, uh, details inside. And then inside the email, it says, this is your last chance. And then they have this kind of countdown timer. So it's a really, um, it's, it's a really well known way of using loss aversion and just letting people know that something's running out on the left. I think this is Macy's when it says it's in store only it's from September 27th to 30. This is, you know, all you could, this is the only time you can do this. 
Um, social Media Examiner, um, I've been, I worked with them now for a couple of months on helping them promote their online event. Not, sorry, not the online event, the actual conference. It's in San Diego. Um, it's probably the biggest and most interesting and most actionable social media marketing conference you will ever attend. And I had a great time working with them. Uh, one of our goals was to increase the sales of the tickets to get more people to come. Um, and it was interesting because what you can see here is just the, the use of loss aversion in a pop-up. So save on your social media marketing world tickets, there's a countdown timer, um, and you can kind of just decide if you want to, what you want to do. Notice how they're using this call to action button here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it says, yes, I want to save. I don't want to save. And that's just a cool way of using loss aversion in terms of like, I would have a very hard time or most people would have a hard time clicking on, I don't want to save because that, that kind of symbolizes the fact that you're going to lose out on something, right? Um, so uh, let it, let's also look at another example of how companies use uh, loss aversion. So Hotjar, this is another great way to use it. Um, you don't have to be as direct and alarming as the first, um, you know, the first different options that I've showed you. Um, in this in this kind of situation you could say okay so you could do it in two ways you could either say hey stop throwing money down the drain which is what most people do right and you can do that with copy even with your subject line you could have in an email like stop throwing your money away or you could say that on a headline on a landing page that would be a great way um, to leverage loss aversion or you could say how many hours have you wasted searching for a solution or um, the solution you're using is holding you back from achieving X. So all of these sentences are just implying that someone is losing out by not taking action. By taking the wrong action, um, it's enough to trigger that bias. Um, so my favorite example, as I was saying before, is Hotjar. And what they're doing is without using actual words, they're implying that you're wasting a ton of money. So they're saying on the left-hand side, you're probably using these five tools or similar five tools, ClickDill, Crazy Egg, Qualaroo, SurveyMonkey, Fneo, which I don't really know. Um, and you're spending a ton of money, or you could be using the new way um, and spend far less. So it's a cool way um, of doing this, of kind of leveraging that loss aversion and saying, hey, dudes, you are losing out by using all of these products here on the left. You could actually, and it's, it's actually quite true because Hotjar only costs $29 a month and each of these products on the left gets you to a couple of hundred dollars a month, if not more. So Hotjar is simply saying, you know, instead of saying stop throwing your money away or instead of saying uh, you're losing out, they just show you and make you feel like you're losing. And if you want to avoid that pain of losing, then you would choose Hotjar. Um, so let me know guys in the chat, if you have seen some cool ways of people using, um, loss aversion, um, on their website. So we spoke about a few different ways you can do that, whether if it's in your emails by just letting people know that something's coming to an end, or there's only a certain amount of products that you can purchase. Um, or even if we're talking about, you know, something's coming to an end now, so it's only, um, it's only three days left and stuff like that. Or we spoke about how you can use it in copy or in visuals. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, Netta says every course ever has used loss of motion. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's, it's a really cool way of doing it. Just one thing about loss of version though, is that you don't want it to be sleazy. You don't want it to be incorrect. You don't want it to be a blatant lie. I know I don't have, I, I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but Many websites do have that, you know, you have a countdown timer and then you arrive on the website the following day and it's restarted or something. So just make sure that you are definitely kind of following, um, you know, being authentic. Uh, so Craig says, I signed up with ConvertBox this week and they did it on me brilliantly. Oh, that's cool. You should um, tell us how they did that. 
Uh, Stephanie says, I really like this hot gel one because it's more subtle. Uh, the countdown timers are everywhere and I hate them along with the no, I don't want to get this benefit buttons. I definitely agree. And I, I think I showed one of these examples last week that was done by social media examiner too. I think it's all about um, how you place them on the website, where they are, where these countdown timers come and play, um, and how you do them. If you do them in an authentic way um, and you tell the customer's story through it and it's not just a warning, warning, time's running out, something's going to blow up, then <laughs> it can work really well. Um, Nikki says, oh wait, I missed, sorry, Montreal says Unbounce did this with their partnership program. That's true. Um, and Nikki says, I just got suckered into a flash sale that had 70% off the first seven, the first hour, 60 off the second. Um, that's 10% was not appealing in comparison. That's a really interesting thing. By the way, Nikki, you're, you're um, sending um, your replies to all panelists. If you want to get everyone to see your answers, you should see all panelists and attendees. Um, so yeah, so there's all these. <laughs> <laughs> Maria Thompson, uh, hi Maria, says that um, the other buttons that say, I'm an idiot for not doing that, uh, for doing what you say. Agreed completely. So loss aversion is definitely a technique you need to master and you need to make people feel, um, you need to make people feel comfortable with, um, with what you're saying and not, you know, overuse it or create something that isn't real. Okay, let's move into the third cognitive bias, bias, which is analysis paralysis. Now, this one, this is one of the biases that many marketers know about or talk about, but seem to forget almost immediately when they're planning landing pages, websites, pricing pages, and stuff like that. Um, analysis paralysis is as simple as it sounds. Um, when we're given too many options, our brain goes into a state of confusion or overthinking and it just chooses not to choose. So think about that. This means that if you give your audience too many options, they will have a very difficult time making a decision and they'll simply opt out of making that decision. So where do we actually see this happen most commonly? Um, this happens in pricing pages. So <laughs> when you have too many plans and you're confusing people, um, you know, it's, it's problematic and people try, yes, this is actual, a few people just wrote to me, oh my God, is that a real um, uh, pricing plan? Yes, that is a real pricing page that I found. Um, so the thing about it is that it's not just about the amount of pricing plans that you have on your design. It's also to do with helping people choose, making it easier to compare. So it's not just about, oh, I, you should only have free pricing plans, but also thinking about how even when you do have free pricing plans, how can you help people make the right decision? So notice the example on the left side, the names of each plan are general, quite common. But on the right, we have uh, multiple techniques helping prospects compare their offerings. So the names, three, one month, one year, um, the highlighted plan and, the, and even the call to action buttons that explain the exact meaning of each plan. So when you click on a button, you know what's going to happen, you know what you're going to get. Um, and you can clearly see that they're favoring um, the one on the right, right? The one year, and it says most popular. So there's the bandwagon effect. Um, so then I guess there's Hotjar, right? So Hotjar is, I, I just love their website and I also love all the examples <laughs> that I can use for them. So um, here's another way that they uh, avoid analysis paralysis and they help people make decisions. So um they allow you to choose a plan firstly according to your need so is it personal business or is it an agency and then according to the amount of page views that you have so all these contribute to reducing analysis paralysis and helping people make a choice easily um, so you can see that they've taken away um, that kind of stress of what plan should i choose what should i do how should i do it 
um, and kind of really walking you through um, your options and essentially helping you identify the right pricing plan for yourself. Um, okay, let's move on to another example. So another important thing that you can do is reduce the fear of making a huge decision. Um, the lighter the consequences are to a decision, the easier it is to make. So make it easy in both a user experience perspective and a psychological pers uh, perspective to make a decision. So for example, allow people to immediately see the value of paying that yearly fee versus the monthly fee by highlighting the cost and the value. So it's just an important thing to do um, focus on the end result, the most desired need of your prospect versus the pricing of the features so that they can see the value easily and find less reasons to persuade themselves against that action. So when someone's coming to your pricing page and they're trying to evaluate stuff, don't only think about, okay, how many plans should I have? Or what should I, you know, how can I highlight the one plan that I want people to take? but how can you reduce that friction by highlighting the end result, the value of it? Um, and it's, it's really cool because when you, really, when you do that, when you highlight the outcomes for people, it really helps us justify our decisions and to feel the gain versus the pain of what it is. Now, Amplitude over here explains the value of their product, how easy it is to get to their, um, how, <laughs> sorry, they explain how easy it is to get started and even highlight the companies that use their solution. So essentially looking at this, you can easily decide where you fit in. Are you more like core, um, Taurus, I think I said that name correctly, sorry. Are you more like Lime? Are you more like Microsoft? Even their navigation bar here um, is used to highlight what you can do with the platform. And I love this. And I'm actually, I think I'm going to actually like swipe this and try and use it on uh, clients' websites. I've never seen this done before um, where you have a drop down menu where it says solutions. And instead of just the list, of, um, of kind of services that they have. It says use Amplitude to set product strategy, improve user engagement, optimize conversion or drive retention. I think it's brilliant. Um, and Nikki's correct, Nikki's, uh, which you can't see her comments. <laughs> She's saying that this is the bandwagon effect to this one where it says all these companies have chosen to um, use um, Amplitude. So, um, oh, she has, sorry, <laughs> you can't see Nikki's comments. So the, mo the most important thing to remember with loss aversion is to reduce friction, have one goal and one goal only ask people to perform one, uh, action, one action only, and don't confuse people with too much information. Um, let me see. Oh, I just, okay, it's the same one. Okay, so I guess that is the most important thing. And as Corey says, K-I-S-S, -S, that's a great, um, keep it simple, stupid. Probably one of the best um, advice that you can give someone. The problem, specifically analysis paralysis, is usually mentioned around pricing pages. So if you are a SaaS company, if you have some sort of pricing plans, that's where, loss, that's where analysis paralysis comes into play. Um, and I guess it's just a matter of simplifying things. And I know that it can get super crazy and super um, confusing when you want and you have many ideas and many options. But when you are reviewing your pricing page, go to your pricing page even right now, look at it and tell me, am I confusing people? Am I making it absolutely super clear to people what pricing plan they can choose? By the way, using names, I'm just gonna go back, um, oops, here, um, to using special names for your pricing plans is actually very, very helpful. It helps people identify who they are. Like Express 10, Express 40, Express 75, or the, what, no, what most companies have, it's like free, pro, uh, ultimate, or platinum, silver, goals, all of these pricing plans, they give you a sense of what's more expensive, but they don't help you choose 
and self like segment yourself. So when you actually give pricing pages, uh, pricing plans, names like growth or enterprise, you're actually helping people segment themselves and quickly identify what type of plan they should be choosing. So that's another way of kind of um, getting that done. So those were our three um, cognitive biases for today. As promised, it was super quick and I was going to do it as actionable as possible and as, hold on, where am I? You can't see me. I'm back. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, um, as I said, I wanted to quickly cover these three cognitive biases, which are uh, loss aversion, bandwagon effect, and analysis paralysis. Three super simple cognitive biases that you can immediately go into your website, your emails, and just make sure, am I using them, or am I overusing them, or should I be avoiding analysis paralysis? What am I kind of doing um, that is maybe um kind of confusing people or sending people away um now let me see if we have any quick questions because i think i've been answering questions throughout um how okay vic says how should we best use colors to help make a decision um so that's actually a very big topic vic um, when you talk about color psychology, color psychology is a huge thing and it has a huge impact on our decision making process. Um, we're going to have a very um, a dedicated workshop just about color psychology in a few weeks. But I'll just say this with color psychology. The one thing you need to remember is that it's not as straightforward as it sounds. It's not just um, red means this and blue means that because that's what how usually we will simplify um, color psychology. If you'd like, we have an article on the website where I get into full details about this, um, how to use color psychology to increase conversions. So that would be, and Sophia's done it again and she's posted it in the chat for you guys. Um, it will give you the sense of direction and a start for using color psychology, um, but you can definitely use it. Not, it's not if you, it's not like if you have a red color on your page, that's going to make people, oh, I should choose this product. It just works with the strategy of everything together. So color psychology doesn't work alone. Just like images don't work alone. Cognitive biases don't work alone. Copy doesn't work alone. Everything has to support each other. Um, okay. So, um, Netta says, this was really easy to consume. Yay, cool. Um, oh, I'm so excited to see everyone's enjoying, enjoyed this and found it very, very helpful. Um, we have a question from Nikki who says, this is a bit off topic, but seeing the slider on the Hotjar page reminded me of this. What have you seen with conversions on sliders versus typing in amounts? Um, so what you're referring to, Nikki's referring to um, the uh, screenshot that I showed you of Hotjar where you can slide and show, like choose how many page views you have. Some companies have you kind of put in, um, type in a number and some companies allow you to slide in like Hotjar. Um, I wouldn't say there's any universal answer, Nikki, like what is better? But from my experience, when you ask people to type something in, so there's a pro and a con to it. When you're asking someone to type in the amount of page views that they have, you're actually getting people to interact with your page. So you're getting that foot in the door. We spoke about this um, a few weeks ago. It's this technique where you're essentially getting people to take one step one small step and then they're more likely to take another one. So in that aspect, asking people to kind of say, hey, how many page views do you have? And actually typing it in is getting people active and more prone to take another action. On the other hand, allowing people to slide just kind of helps them uh, process it easily. It's for those lazy people who don't really know how many page views they have or they want to see, they want to compare and they want to know, well, right now I have 5,000, but I'm going to reach 10,000. So how much is that going to cost? So it really is more about your goals with the pricing page and knowing your audience, which I know is an annoying, <laughs> annoying answer. But if you know that people on the website, the visitors um, on your B2B uh, client 
aren't that active, they don't really take too many um, actions, then it might be a cool thing to do to ask them to enter some sort of number like page views or something or teammates or whatever it is. Um, and if you know that people are not likely to answer, you don't want them to even do that, you just want to give people an easy way to compare things, then I'd use the slider. But as usual, test, test, and test. Um, okay, so we have uh, Stephanie. I love the concrete examples of how different companies are using these tactics. That's awesome. Um, cool. As I promised, this was going to be super quick, uh, actionable for you guys. Um, and that's it. Um, so in 48 hours, we'll have the video, the transcript, um, the worksheets, and the slides all uploaded to our blog so that you will be able to check them out and review them. And if you have any questions, then just let me know in the blog. Next week, we are walking into our last week of psychology and persuasion. Um, and I'll introduce the next month of what's going on. There's lots of things that are happening. I'm really excited about them. Um, and I will email you early next week with next week's topic. It's a surprise. Um, so thank you everyone for attending, um, for taking time out of your day to learn. And I hope this was super helpful. And until I see you next week, stay awesome. Have a great weekend or a week um, and enjoy. See you soon. Bye.